Welcome to CCG China and World Dialogue Series. My name is Henry Wang Hui Yao, founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization and host of the CCG Global Dialogue Series. Following our last conversation with Larry Summers, Hank Pao Sing, and a new focus at CCG 8th China Globalization Forum, uh, we are incredibly happy now to invite another world-renowned economist, the founder of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, PIE, and author of the United States versus China, the quest for global economic leadership, C. Fred Bergsten. Dr. Bergsten is a prominent economist and an expert in trade and economics. He served as Assistant Secretary for International Affairs of the U.S. Treasury throughout the late 70s and early 80s, functioned as an Undersecretary for Monetary Affairs from 1980 to 1981, and was Assistant for International Economic Affairs to Dr. Henry Kissinger at the National Security Council from 1969 to 1971. He was appointed by President Obama to the Advisory Committee on the Trade Policy and the negotiations in 2010 and 2014, and reappointed by President Trump in 2018. Dr. Bergsten had a tremendous impact on politics that shaped the US trade relations with the world. He was chairman of the Competitive Policy Council created by the US Congress from 1991 to 1995. He was also the chairman of APEC Imminent Person Group from 1993 to 1995. And also he writing three reports that later become part of the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. So Dr. Bergsten is, uh, uh, Bergsten is also the prolific writer. He's the author, co-author, and the ad editor of uh, almost nearly 50 books on a wide range of international economic issues, particularly those on the US-China economic relation. He also published widely on economic groups and trade negotiations, and will currently uh, implement many multilateral trade agreements between US and other countries. I just had a, a, a small talk before our event uh, with uh, uh, doc, Dr. Brixton, and uh, you are the founder of the uh, PIE, so uh, that was quite a while ago, and uh, perhaps you can give a little, uh, uh, you know, update for our audience. You know, <laughs> why, when, and uh, and why you founded uh, one of those uh, top think tanks uh, in the world, uh, Fred? <laughs> yeah, why don't you have an opening remark, please? Well, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, it's great to be with you tonight. I appreciate the invitation. Um, it turned out that. The United States was a little late among countries in getting integrated into the world economy, uh, but it really happened in the 1970s with the oil shocks and uh, the dollar devaluations, the Nixon shocks and all that. Um, and so one of the major U.S. foundations uh, discovered that the U.S. had no think tank, no research institution devoted to global economic issues. They asked me if I would start, create, develop, and run such an institution. It was a huge challenge, but I took it on in 1981. Uh, I built it from scratch. As you said, it's now become one of the leading think tanks in the world on, on any topic, uh, along with yours and many others in China. Uh, and so it's been a fantastic uh, 40 years since I started the Institute, uh, it has now become world known, world famous, and I think uh, quite influential on a number of policy issues. So I'm hoping we can help uh, restore a stronger and more fruitful relationship between China and the United States. And uh, through that, strengthen the global economic system, which has been so important to all of us and particularly to our own two countries. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Fred. And I actually, yeah, it's a great think tank. I, I had the pleasure of, of joining an exchange hosted by Adam Posen and Alan Wolf at uh, Peterson Institute just uh, early in July, actually. So it's really great to, to see uh, you also that, uh, uh, you know, coming to uh, 
to dialogue with CCG because I had a dialogue with uh, uh, Adam and Alan before. And uh, so we had a, a great uh, respect for Peterson, which has been really at the forefront of a global globalization and global uh, trading system. So, so today we are actually very interested to 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 uh, have this dialogue again with you. And uh, so, perhaps you know, the, we we have this book. You know, the uh, the the new book, your new book, United States versus China: uh, The Quest for Global Economic Leadership. And uh, you have brought uh, your unique experience as an active participant in and continue an observer, of course, the evolution of a global economy leadership. For, for almost 60 years. But of course, again, you mentioned that your think tank was started uh, in 1981. At almost the same time as China opened up in 1979. And uh, so, so you know, those are enormous changes. So I'm, I'm wondering that, uh, you know, what, what is the, you know, maybe you could give a very quick uh, summary of your book and then we can go into some details. Uh, why are you <laughs> writing this book? And, and I, I was really newly published, uh, you know, just about a year ago. And uh, but it's really a, a, a great timing and a great uh, angle and, and great emphasis on this uh, global economic uh, uh, leadership. So, so perhaps, uh, Fred, you can give a little uh, uh, a summary of, of your theme of the book, and, and then we can look into detail of this book. What prompted you to write this book? <laughs> I wrote the book because I think the single most important issue facing the world economy over the next several decades is whether we can work together to find a cooperative leadership role between China and the United States. I say that because I think the global economic system has been a tremendous success over the last 75 years. It has brought an unprecedented period of prosperity and stability to the world economy. It has enabled countries like China and most notably China to have economic development miracles that are greater than any other in human history. It has brought major, major benefits to the United States. Our studies show the U.S is $2 trillion per year richer as a result of the globalization of the last 75 years. But that international economic system has rested to an important extent on the leadership of the United States. Back in the 1930s, when Great Britain was the previous leader, but lost the ability to continue to lead, the United States was the rising power and was not very cooperative. In fact, helped turn the world's recessions in the 1930s into the Great Depression, which led on to the Second World War. After the Second World War, of course, the world decided to create the Bretton Woods system, the whole network of rules and institutions, which have underpinned the dramatically successful global economic order of this period. But the United States which has been the leading country, though with a lot of help from others, the United States can no longer provide that leadership on its own. And the reason is simple. For the first time in the 100 years since the US became the world's leading economy, it now has a roughly equal power that is challenging it for global economic leadership. And that of course is China. Major point number one in my book is that China is now roughly equivalent to the United States in terms of capability to lead the world economy and provide the kind of leadership that is needed. And if that's true, then the question is whether the main countries involved, China and the United States, but the rest of the world as well, can find ways in which the two leading countries, the two economic superpowers, can cooperatively, jointly, in parallel, lead a continued, open, successful world economic system. At the moment, things do not look too good. As we know, relations between China and the United States are fraught with many difficulties. They are headed 
according to some people in both our countries, even toward a new Cold War and a confrontation, which would not only be incredibly dangerous for global security and political relationships, but would also threaten to destroy the world economic system. Back in the 1930s, when Britain could no longer lead and the U.S., the rising power at the time, was unwilling to lead, the global economy spiraled into depression and led to world war. We, have to, we must avoid, we must avoid any similar development today. And that places responsibility foremost on the shoulders of our two countries, China and the United States. What I propose in my book is a new system of what I call functional decoupling. We know that China and the United States will disagree on a lot of political, security, values, issues. And I think that's inevitable. It's unfortunate, but I'm afraid it's inevitable, at least for some time. My proposal is that despite those disagreements on other issues, we recognize that our cooperation is essential if the world economic system is to prevail and to continue to support a, 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 a stable and prosperous world economy and contribute to a more peaceful world in the broader sense as well. So my whole set of proposals is based on finding ways between our two countries to take that kind of cooperative lead. I think there are some recent signs that are quite positive. Just earlier this summer, China and the United States got together at the Ministerial Conference of the World Trade Organization, worked out a deal on the very important issue of exceptions to the intellectual property rules to permit developing countries to start producing a, a, a COVID vaccine. China and the United States came to the agreement that saved the WTO ministerial, and I would argue, maintain the ability of the WTO, which is very important, to help lead the world trading system. Just a couple of weeks ago, our two countries reached an agreement on the financial markets, uh, on the continued listing and trading of securities of a number of Chinese companies on the New York Stock Exchange and in the US markets, which is very important for continuing the desired flows of foreign capital and investment into China, that had been threatened by a disagreement between our countries over the uh, uh, provision of data so that the US regulators could know what the Chinese companies were doing, make them more transparent to investors in our country and abroad. That issue had been festering for several years. Uh, it now seems to be on the way to reconciliation. So from that, I take good news that despite, despite the continued tensions between our countries, which are very real and very important, and were highlighted by Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan recently, despite those tensions, our two countries have seen a pragmatic way to resolve serious economic issues and provide joint leadership to the world economy. It's a fact that China and the United States are the two economic superpowers. Only if they agree can major global economic issues be resolved effectively and satisfactorily. Global warming is a case in point, where as recently as 2015, our two countries got together took the lead at the Paris conference and enabled the biggest step forward so far in international efforts to deal with climate change. That's in a few bumps lately. That's unfortunate. I think that needs to get back together. People talk about a Thucydides trap, the risk that China and the United States uh, could spiral into real conflict. Well, in my book, I argue that there's an economic Thucydides trap that the rising power of China does challenge the incumbent power of the United States. And we can see already there is 
a trade war, as you mentioned. There's a trade war between our two countries. It's still out there. It's still outstanding. Uh, the Biden administration replaced Trump, but has not resolved the trade war. So that seems to me to be very high on the agenda, that our two countries need to get together to resolve the trade conflict between us, signal that we are ready to cooperate on economic issues, both in the interest of strengthening and improving our bilateral relationship, but in a way even more important, providing the kind of joint leadership that would permit the global economic system to continue to be successful. We've now got a world economy that is threatened by high inflation in a lot of countries, including the United States, by the risk of a significant recession in a number of countries. China's own growth has slowed down a lot. We need desperately to have effective global economic leadership, restore the system, keep the economies moving in the right direction, and that's going to require a new vision, new cooperation, new policy initiatives between China and the United States. I'm delighted to be here to talk with you about that uh, today and uh, look forward to our conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, great. Uh, excellent. Uh... Uh, you know, summary uh, and the highlight of your of your book. It's really <laughs> a very timely book. And uh, yeah, you 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 outlined uh, and also in your uh, you know this uh, uh, opening remark, you talked about you know we are we are in the world now. We have uh, uh, you know deglobalization. We have uh, you mentioned the uh, this trap. Well, you also mentioned in the book of uh, Kinderberger, you know, uh, trap. And uh, and of course uh, the, the the things this. Uh, uh, mentioned about uh, uh, functional decoupling. You know, <laughs> we should really economically, we should probably rather than decouple, we should strengthen that. But while probably maintain the differences and uh, trying to accept each other as time goes on. But uh, but but look at the, uh, the 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 current crisis now. We have uh, you know almost three years of uh, pandemic. You know, we, which has uh, uh, greatly uh, damaged the uh, world economy, including China. But also, uh, we have this uh, Ukraine-Russian <laughs> conflict, which is uh, is escalating uh, still. Uh, so, so the world is uh, is uh, is almost like a, a situation we are coming to a, a second world war. We had a, a, a new Britain with the moment now. You know, uh, if we if we want to emerge out of this uh, uh, pandemic war, if we want to emerge of the Ukraine-Russian war, you know, what are the new a global system that we can really uh, strengthen. Uh, you you mentioned WTO. Absolutely, we we need more strengthening on that. And Peterson is always a a great institute uh, doing a lot of research on the global trading. But we also have uh, uh, you know the, uh, uh, the RCEP, which is China is really getting active. Us CPTPP, which I think Peterson has done a lot of work uh, uh, on that in the past. TPP, I mean. <laughs> Uh, and you personally involved that. That was really a great uh, uh, scheme. Uh, so what about the DEPA, you know, digital uh, partnership that is China also trying to join and uh, launched by uh, New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile. And uh, so, so, so in terms of uh, where, you know, you, you talk about economic global leadership in this book. So where, where are we, uh, you know, uh, where can we start? <laughs> How can we really... Uh, moving things forward. I mean, now we uh, we had some progress. You you you, you are right. You know, we have this uh, uh, listing, uh, the listing issue. Uh, you know, currently resolved in the U.S. for Chinese companies. We have uh, this uh, uh, that's e enormously uh, positive. We have this uh, MC12 minister meeting at the WTO that uh, finally China, U.S., EU reached some concept. But what what in your you know, uh, uh, opinion. What are the things we need to strengthen uh, if we want to really uphold the global leadership and economic global leadership? And of course, going forward, how can we really solve the crisis? I mean, economic global leadership should prevail uh, strongly so that we can balance the others. As, as you say, uh, there are many opportunities, there are many possibilities for getting together for the US and China to get together uh, to provide uh, uh, global economic leadership. The United States made a huge mistake 
in dropping out of the original Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. That was a massive error by President Trump, supported by some Democrats in the Congress, uh, but it was a huge error. It was a great credit to the other Asian countries that went ahead with the TPP on their own, converted it into the CPTPP, and now I am very pleased that China has uh, applied to join the CPTPP. I think the United States should come back into the CPTPP. It's not a popular thing in Washington these days, uh, but neither was it very popular with President Obama uh, before he saw the need to come in to support Asian regional development and engage the U.S. Uh, institutionally uh, in the economic process in Asia. Um, so one possibility, which I think would be very desirable, would be for both China and the United States to enter the CPTPP. In fact, we could negotiate some of our bilateral economic differences within that regional context. And I think uh, uh, maybe that would be a, a less politically difficult way to do so. Um, we mentioned the WTO. It needs reform in any event because it's lost a lot of its global role. Uh, but the WTO has been extremely helpful in dealing with some China-US trade differences in the past. Uh, China has taken the US to the WTO. The US has taken China to the WTO. Uh, both our countries have mainly complied with rulings against them. And it's a good way to try to settle our disputes. Um, the WTO rules are not adequate to cover some of the trade problems of today. Uh, but China and the US together need to sit down and work out new rules on things like subsidy, intellectual property rights, technology transfer. All those things need new and updated rules because the rules are now pretty old, pretty out of date. And we need together, together, I stress, to work out new rules and norms. Let me mention one other area, international finance. One of the big disparities in global economic leadership today is the International Monetary Fund. China's economy, as I said before, is for all practical purposes, roughly equivalent to the United States. Uh, it's bigger than the US on some metrics, it's still a bit smaller on others, but it will catch up within the next decade. So for all practical purposes, China and the US are roughly equivalent. And China's a bigger trader, has more foreign exchange reserves, has bigger flows of direct investment in both directions. But China's quota and voting rights in the International Monetary Fund are only one third that of the United States and an even smaller ratio to that of the Europeans when you take them together. This is ridiculous. China's share in the IMF needs to be dramatically increased. And what I propose in my book is that over time, over the next several quota periods, as they call it in the IMF, we aim to equal, equalize the quotas in the IMF between China and the United States and the Europeans taken as a group, if they can get their act together and, and take a single seat. That would recognize China's rough equivalence with the U.S., it would recognize China's ability to provide leadership in the international financial area. Incidentally, I argue in my book that China has in fact provided very constructive, very effective leadership in the international financial area on a number of occasions, going all the way back to the Asian crisis in the late 1970s. The global financial crisis, 2008, China had the fastest and biggest stimulus program to save the world from a deep depression. So China has clearly taken very effective leadership. On the other hand, China has also deviated from the important rules in some cases. Uh, China's currency manipulation 10 to 20 years ago, it's in the past, it's not happening now, but in the past was an important deviation from the basic IMF rule not to competitively devalue your currency. And that's one of the reasons that 
other countries, including the United States, have complained about Chinese economic policies and have uh, uh, raised uh, problems, uh, raised threats, raised reactions to China, uh, and why, frankly, support, political support for globalization in the United States has declined over the last 20 or so years. That trend has to be reversed if the U.S. is to restore its share, its participation in global economic leadership. I think an important message for China is that some of its own policies have caused important negative reactions and backlashes in other countries, like the trade war from the United States. Not that the U.S. is blameless. The U.S. sometimes violates the rules, too. But China, now as a leading, perhaps the leading economic superpower, has a huge impact on the rest of the world when its own policies deviate from international norms and rules. Now, China will frequently say, but we didn't write those rules. We weren't involved in that. And that's why I say the WTO needs reform, the IMF needs reform, in which China and the United States and the Europeans and some others sit down and work out revised global rules and norms under which we can all live successfully and restore a cooperative and effectively functioning international economic order. Great, a great thread. And that's, uh, that's really uh, an enormous message. I think you've been really uh, thinking globally and, uh, and uh, particularly about the global system reform. And, I am particularly impressed with what you said on this uh, IMF, actually, uh, you know, International Financial Monetary Fund, that uh, uh, you're right. China was really, uh, uh, during the Asian financial crisis, 2008 financial crisis, uh, you know, China has actually not uh, devalued the RMB, but really, uh, you know, put all the stimulus packages and, uh, and, and even now during the pandemic, in the last two years, China's trade has been, uh, uh, at all time high. Uh, last year was 30% increase. So still trying to stabilize the global economy. I, I think, yeah, that, that, is, that would be really great uh, idea that if we can uh, get, get China uh, a rightful place in IMF and, and, uh, and similar organizations so that we can, we can really uh, harness and, and maximize the, uh, uh, the, the, the contribution that China can make. And uh, and to, to to the global uh, uh, governance and uh, economic governance and, and the multilateral system, I, I actually talked to uh, Larry Summers some time ago. I mean, also in the in a, in a development banks uh, arena. Of course, China has launched this uh, uh, AIB Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, and uh, uh, Larry Summers used to work at the World Bank and. So what do you think about in the, in the development bank field? I mean, we recently see a, a, a trend now to trying to, you know, people are doing on, on uh, different blocks are doing on their own now. And there's a campaignization of a different uh, a scheme that, uh, that are not really working together rather than they are separate each other. For example, China has, uh, 10, 12 years ago, China launched this Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. But recently we see, uh, you know, uh, President Biden launched the B3W, and then G7 talked about the infrastructure plan, and then EU uh, global gateway. So all the government realized, you know, after climate changes, infrastructure probably is the biggest denominator of of all the countries at helping global south and and things like that. Uh, I also talked one time to uh, to uh, uh, you know the former World Bank president. You know, I mean, I mean they, they were they were we were thinking if we can really work together on, on the infrastructure. So, so what do you think there's a possibility, like you know, AIB is led by China, World Bank is led by the US, ADB is led by Japan, but uh, you know, European banks and, and Latin American banks, can, can the development banks really work together or upgrade AIB to a, to a global infrastructure in banks where US, China, EU, and, and many other countries can have something to work on in to, to really re reconstruct the world? I mean. Also, uh, after Ukraine crisis, we can we can reconstruct on that Ukraine as well. So well, China, 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 yeah. China, yeah, no, absolutely right. China has, of course, become the world's largest development lender uh, by a large margin. 
And so development finance is a natural area for China uh, to take the leading role, the leading role in uh, coordinating world efforts uh, and putting together the needed uh, assistance to the developing world and, and promote global growth in that way. Uh, another huge mistake that the United States made, and this was under Obama, was to reject China's invitation to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank right at the start. Uh, Larry Summers and I fully agree. Uh, it was a huge mistake for the U.S. not to join. It was an even bigger mistake for the U.S. to lobby its traditional allies not to join. They, of course, rejected the U.S. effort and almost all of them did join, and the AIIB is a big success, including through its cooperation with the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and other multilateral institutions. Um, in my view, and I say this strongly in my book, the United States should now come back in and come to its friends in Beijing and say, well, we've thought about this again, we want to join the AIIB, become a non-regional member like we are in other development banks and uh, contribute positively to the outcome. Uh, the AIIB, I think, has an impeccable record so far uh, in terms of conforming with uh, international rules, international norms. Uh, it's quickly scaled up and become a significant lender. And so uh, I agree with you, and it's in keeping with what I said before on trade and, and monetary affairs. Uh, instead of having separate China path, US path, Europe path, <laughs> we need to get them together. The competition is good in some senses, uh, and maybe the AIIB and the, the World Bank uh, stimulate each other to do better, uh, but both of them have seen the merit already of co-financing lots of projects. And I think in the future, more of that is needed. Uh, that relates to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, there have been some suspicions, as you know, that the Belt and Road Initiative is aimed at pr promoting some of China's uh, more narrowly security or political uh, foreign policy objectives. Uh, also maybe building up excessive debt in some of the borrowing countries. And some of that is now starting to show up. So I would think it would be better for both the BRI itself and for the U.S. and other uh, non-participants at the moment to get together and try to strengthen those kinds of uh, results. What, what I argue in my book is that China must play a lead role in managing the global economy, and that requires the global economy to accept some changes in the rules and norms uh, that China would prefer. Uh, some of those would be uncomfortable for the U.S. and other countries. Some might even be unacceptable. But the issue is to get together, negotiate on those, talk about them, and try in a spirit of cooperation and the need to get together satisfactorily uh, if we're going to get any success. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, something that I wanted to pick up on. Um, one thing that I think in terms of U.S. policy, one thing we know will not work, which is containment. Trump tried containment, tried to restrain China, re resisted uh, almost any Chinese initiative. Uh, resisted anything that seemed to provide some benefits for China, even if they provided benefits to the United States too, like trade between our countries. Um, as you said, and that's what triggered my thought, as you said, China continued to grow right through the whole COVID crisis. China was the only major country that kept growing through the COVID crisis. That slowed down a bit now, but right through the two years of pandemic, China kept growing. China's share of world trade, world investment, everything else kept growing during that period, despite the trade war with the United States. China-U.S. trade dropped sharply, but China's overall trade grew 
enormously, as you indicated. So containment clearly does not work. China is too big. China is too dynamic. And even if the United States tried to do it, no other countries would join the United States in that effort. Uh, and that's been proven. Uh, no other countries joined Trump's trade war against China. Um, so where I would start in trying to restore the kind of relationship we need is to eliminate the trade war. That could be done on a totally reciprocal basis. There's no need for the United States to uh, be seen as giving anything to China to get rid of the trade war. I'm quite confident if the U.S. was willing to get rid of its tariffs on Chinese products, China would reciprocate by getting rid of the tariffs that it reciprocally put on U.S. goods uh, as the trade war built up. It would be a dramatic step if our two countries could get together, roll back those tariffs, end the trade war, restore a much larger level of trade between our countries, and do in that way restore a huge amount of confidence in the global trading system, the World Trade Organization, and the whole rules-based system. That would be hugely in our interest, particularly at this time of global economic difficulty. Now, there would still be some trade conflicts between our countries. We would have to, I think, in the same negotiation, uh, go back to the drawing board, try to work on those, see if we could come up with some new rules, hopefully multilateral rules that could be implemented in the WTO and maybe the CPTPP and, and elsewhere in, in uh, regional as well as multilateral organizations. Uh, but I think unless our two countries are prepared to continue the current drift toward Cold War, and unless the U.S. foolishly thinks that it could really conduct a successful policy of containment toward China, the only alternative is really to seek a new cooperative mode. So that's what I'm urging my own country. The, a piece of good news that I'll add before I stop talking here is that the Biden policy does permit the kind of functional decoupling I'm talking about. Now, let me be clear what I'm talking about. I'm against national decoupling. A lot of people talk about decoupling the U.S. and China in an overall sense. That would be a disaster in my view, and it could not work and it should not even be tried. Functional decoupling says, recognize we will have some problems on the security side, on the political side, but we must cooperate pragmatically on the economic side, and we can do that, as these recent events show, even while we are disagreeing on topics in other domains. I think that approach is what we need to be pursuing now. The Biden construct permits for that even before he was in office. President Biden was writing articles, uh, Jake Sullivan, other top people in the administration were writing articles, and they've said it since they've been in office. They see U.S.-China relations as proceeding in different baskets. Some baskets of issues will produce confrontation. Some will produce competition. And some will produce, they hope, cooperation, and they cite global warming, pandemic response. And I would then put economic issues into that cooperation basket. I think that's the crucial point now, that in addition to global warming, hopefully pandemic responses, we need to get agreement at the highest levels of our governments to put economic issues in this cooperative basket. Functional decoupling, I think it's demonstrated that it can work. It's been working in other areas. It's worked with other countries. Uh, I think it's even working in the Ukraine crisis. And I believe that's the vision, that's the path that our two countries must pursue or else the drift in a negative direction toward a new Cold War, I'm afraid, will continue. Yes, yes, uh, Fred. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that... Uh... You know, we, we are seeing a trend of, uh, of drifting apart, you know, very, very quickly. And, uh, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, we, we need to build up mechanism to talk. I mean, I'm really pleased to hear that, uh, 
you know, uh, you, you, you recommend uh, US to, to, to come back to CPTPP and, and also to join AIB, you know, that would be really great uh, initiatives too. I, I, I think now because, uh, because of these uh, geopolitical tensions and, uh, and uh, you know, all those uh, uh, deglobalization, negative uh, sentiment narrative, I agree with you. We do see some changes from Biden administration to from Trump administration. Uh, but but still, even Trump administration is evolving. You know, there used to be, uh, you know, com competition <laughs> uh, and and then cooperation and com and and confront. They have to. So so now it becomes invest, uh, uh, you know, alliance and uh, compete. So so I mean, if it's invest in the U.S., it's okay. Let's 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 boost up U.S. And if it's a, uh, uh, you know, uh, but if it's an airline, but let's have more economic alliance rather than the security alliance. Uh, you know, when the China is doing all the economic alliance, you know, BI, RCEP, CPTPP, and, and China African Corporation. But, you know, so, so US is having more AUKUS, uh, Quad, and uh, Five Eyes, and, and things like that. So, so it's not really uh, good that uh, if we can do more economic uh, cooperation. But I, I really think that, uh, uh, you know, your idea of this uh, 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 functional uh, the company. So, so can we reach that, uh, 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 you know, uh, that uh, kind of... Uh, uh, advantage that we really put economic development, the the the, the, the livelihood of the global population uh, of the mankind ahead of uh, 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 you know the geopolitical differences, and uh, so so that is really seems hard to do. But what do you think? Uh, where are the fundamental problems? Are because, uh, for example, you know we we see the, uh, the polarized the U.S. We're having an election season coming up. Uh, we 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 midterm is is just a, a few weeks away, and there's a polarization on on, on the opinions on, on both sides of the U.S. Uh, but then they are they are very unified on China. <laughs> it's because uh, because there's a, there's a, you know the, the 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 middle class in the U.S. is not really getting much. For example, last several decades, so one percent of Wall Street is really uh, equal 40, 50 percent of the mass population wealth. And, uh, and then China often is the, to be blamed on. So what do you think about this uh, global corporate uh, minimum tax? So let's address some of those roots problems. You know, maybe multinationals should benefit more of, the, of its domestic economy uh, rather than put uh, their money elsewhere, where China often gets blamed <laughs> for, for well, stealing, the, stealing jobs right. and things like that. Yeah. Well, the, 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 US, uh, the US has a lot of problems, we know. Uh, economic problems, social problems, political dysfunction problems. Uh, so the United States has a lot of work to do to pull up its own socks. Uh, and some of the dissatisfaction in the U.S. Uh, does spill over to uh, opposition against globalization, despite its great benefits for the U.S. And some of that, in turn, spills over to China. Uh, since China is really the first real economic challenger to the United States in 100 years, uh, it's natural, I think, that some uh, uh, concerns are pointed toward China, uh, particularly uh, when some of China's policies, as I said before, uh, do create problems with the international rules, the international norms. I mentioned the currency manipulation of 10 to 20 years ago. That's in the past. But that was a big factor in, uh, in hurting jobs in the U.S., uh, leading China to a massive trade surpluses, uh, which for a time uh, exacerbated unemployment and other difficulties in the United States. So uh, what I'm proposing is what I call in my book conditional competitive cooperation. <laughs> it's got three parts. Uh, we've already talked about competition and cooperation. Uh, but I also say conditional, because now that China is roughly equivalent with the United States in, in most economic metrics, uh, China, in addition to achieving a leadership position in the global economy, has to contribute, of course, to that. So uh, moving forward together has to be done on a reciprocal basis. I mentioned getting rid of the trade war. That's an easy one, because... China put on its tariffs to retaliate against the U.S. tariffs. And if the U.S. takes off its tariffs, I, sense, I suppose, I suspect, I would hope, 
it would be natural for China to eliminate its tariffs at the same time. So there'd be full reciprocity. And if President Biden were inclined to do it, nobody could charge him with being soft on China or giving it away or uh, or being soft hearted. Uh, that's the kind of thing I have in mind. Likewise, in the IMF, I talk about China achieving equality, equal quotas and votes to the U.S. and Europe. I think that is highly desirable. At the same time, China would then have to agree, seriously, to conform to the rules of the IMF, which include avoiding competitive devaluation. Now, that's easy for China. Uh, it has not done any competitive devaluation now for over 10 years. Uh, in fact, it's, as we all know, facing a weakening currency now, and it's trying to keep the currency from getting weaker. So it's intervening in the other direction to try to strengthen the currency, which is fine uh, and needs simply to be enshrined in the, in the rules in a more explicit way. Um, so there are many areas, including the trade rules, as I mentioned, rules governing subsidies, technology transfers, intellectual property rights, all of those rules need to be updated uh, through cooperative negotiation, including China and the United States and the other key trading countries. Uh, it needs to be done on a reciprocal basis, fairly balanced, but, but taking full account of China's new role, China's leadership potential, China's leadership responsibilities, as well as those of the United States and its traditional allies in Europe and Canada and elsewhere. So uh, that's the whole package as I see it. Uh, I want to be clear with you and, and other Chinese friends, uh, this would have to be done in a way that was uh, reciprocal, uh, was done in a fair and balanced way uh, between two essential equals, uh, uh, the two superpowers. Uh, I've talked in the past, as you probably know, of a G2, uh, where the U.S. and China uh, would actually be the inner core of the leadership group. Not that they would exclude anybody else, far from it. Uh, many other countries need to continue playing a central role, the Europeans, Canada, Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, others, uh, who have played a very constructive role uh, during the U.S.-China trade war, incidentally, to keep the, the global economic system moving ahead uh, positively. Uh, but a G2 with the U.S. and China very informally working together at the center of a series of concentric circles. The next circle might be a G3 or G4, bring in Europe, maybe Japan, uh, then the G7, maybe with China, uh, then the G20. Uh, there are lots of groups. Uh, but we know from history that the global economic system only functions successfully and effectively if it has effective leadership. The U.S., because it was the uh, dominant economy, did provide that for a long time, as I said at the start. It could no longer do so by itself or even with its traditional allies. China must now be part of that. And that's the simple pragmatic factor that led me to say at the start, this is the most important underlying issue facing the world economy and maybe world politics as well for the next several decades, finding a way to translate the new power equilibrium into a governance equilibrium where China can take its rightful role, its justified role in the leadership system, uh, providing the kind of leadership that's necessary for the world, moving the world somewhat in the direction of its own preferences, but also making some changes in its own policy that will uh, enable the world as a whole to move forward. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Fred. That's really uh, quite a uh, uh, you know, strong argument. I, I, I agree you know, that uh, we, we really have to uh, you know, enhance the global economic leadership, and uh, particularly uh, U.S. and China should work together. And uh, you talk about this, uh, you know, we, we have this uh, rivalry with reason. I mean, as Graham Allison mentioned in the ri <laughs> rivalry partnership, Joseph uh, uh, Nye also mentioned, uh, you know, and uh, so, so this, uh, this uh, conditional 
uh, competitive cooperation, uh, you know, is, uh, is uh, you know, we hope that can work. And, uh, the, but what do you think about, uh, you know, you talk about, you know, what we're getting from G0, G1, G2. Uh, what about G3? I mean, EU now, it seems to be still very large economically, uh, a block. And, uh, and also the, the things now, US and China often have some uh, uh, conflict and, and, uh, and the differences. And, and EU actually, it, is it better situated in the, in, the, in the middle that maybe can, you know, help mediate <laughs> all kind yes, of... Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yes I, 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 agree with, I, I agree with that. Uh, yes. and, I, and I say in my book that a G3 actually would be ideal. Mm. The problem, of course, is that the European Union does not speak with a single voice on most issues. It does on trade. Uh, it does on a few other issues, but it does not on monetary affairs. It does not on macroeconomics. In fact, they even have big debates within Europe on a lot of those issues. Um, if they would become a true economic union, as I think they want to, and they probably will over the next 20 or 30 years, uh, then a G3 would be possible. In the meanwhile, I agree that Europe can play a big role. As I said a minute ago, they have been quite constructive, I think, during this period of U.S.-China trade warfare, uh, keeping the multilateral system going. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in the WTO, they put in place a dispute settlement mechanism to substitute for the one that the Trump administration uh, destroyed. Uh, that's been very constructive. And a lot of countries, including China, uh, have agreed to participate in that. Um, so the Europeans, to be sure, can play a very important role, and, and we need to work with them at all times. Um, I know China always wants to be part of a multilateral uh, approach to deal with these issues. And I think with Europe kind of intermediating in the way you suggest, uh, I think that's quite possible. Uh, I want to say one other thing to comment you made before. We talked about the uh, consensus in the United States about China uh, and kind of worry that that uh, uh, is a factor in putting us on the path toward the confrontation of the new Cold War. There is widespread agreement in the United States uh, that China is a true competitor to the United States, is a true rival in many ways and the first real one in a hundred years. So there is a consensus on that. However, there is no consensus in the United States on how to respond to that. Trump tried containment, as I say, it failed. Biden has continued some of Trump's policies, but his tone has been very different. He's tried to work with China, for example, on climate change, on the pandemic responses, on these several economic issues that I mentioned before, uh, which has been quite successful. So I think it is still too soon to say how Biden will come out on these topics. There is some good news. As I said, the U.S. has to get its own act together in many ways. And just in this last few months, the Congress passed the biggest infrastructure investment legislation in the United States in over 60 years. So we're beginning to deal with our problems of inadequate infrastructure. Just in the last few weeks, Congress passed major legislation to increase U.S. research and development spending, U.S. efforts in the semiconductor industry, which of course is at the forefront of global technology. So part of the response to the China challenge that we're already seeing in the United States is actually constructive domestic steps to try to improve America's performance. Now, we've still got a long way to go on fiscal policy, on our political system, uh, our election system, our race relations. We still have a long way to go, but there is good news. And sometimes lost in all the bad news is the fact that we have had two major pieces of new legislation this year, strengthening the US domestic economy, the US social structure. I think we're going to see more of that in the coming years, because there is bipartisan agreement that the U.S. does face a China challenge and that the fundamental response to that is domestic. 
we need to improve our own performance, get our own act together to regain the confidence of China and the rest of the world, as well as for our own purposes. But in addition, we, of course, need to strengthen our relationship with China directly. And that's what I emphasize in my book and in my remarks tonight. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Fred. This is a really a strong argument. I mean, I, I read your book. It's, it's a, a marvelous book. I, I recommend uh, to the Chinese readers uh, uh, to read that as well. And hopefully it can be translated into Chinese too. Uh, you know, we're probably coming to, to, the, to the last part of, uh, you know, the last five, ten minutes of our ending uh, of our dialogue. What, what, I, what I would like to see, you know, I mean, you, you emphasize so much the, 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 the necessity for China and U.S. to work together. And we, we felt the same, you know, strongly. I mean, uh, so, so even though, as you said, you know, the China is rising. I mean, it has, has its own uh, logic. And they have a 5,000 years history, uh, uninterrupted civilization, and a great tradition of Confucianism and uh, with the modern economic globalization that generates a tremendous uh, uh, developing uh, capacities. That is the hardest of global peace and the prosperity. China never colonized any places and uh, uh, or, or trying to uh, you know send the troops anywhere. So 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 how can we really you know uh, uh, you know put more emphasis on those uh, common uh, benefit? There's still enormous uh, U.S. Uh, companies uh, investment operation in China. Tesla is the largest uh, uh, clean automobile producer in the world and the largest manufacturer of Tesla is in China and uh, they export a lot of that. Uh, which is a good example, but but we worry about this Taiwan thing. You know, recently the Congress is putting on the uh, Taiwan Policy uh, Act, and then we know that recently has been uh, diluted a bit. You know, like it used to be, they want to uh, elevate the Taipei office to Taiwan office as a requirement. Now it's a, it's a recommendation. You know, the uh, uh, U.S. administration may take it or may not, and also they they, they said they they want to. Have the representative to Taiwan to Taipei be uh, ratified by the by the Congress? Now they, they, they don't they drop that. So we, we see some uh, you know uh, watering down on on, on, on those uh, uh, act. So 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 what do you think? Uh, uh, you know, can we really <laughs> U.S. and China? Uh, what's your what's your uh, uh, therapy or what's your <laughs> uh, well, recommendation? How we can get get along? I mean, even with this complexity and and and, and really tension going on. Well. Taiwan is the issue that dramatizes uh, most uh, clearly what I'm talking about. Um, I'm afraid we probably will continue to disagree on Taiwan. Uh, I think we can do it within the context Recording of the, in progress. Three, of the three communiques. I think we can uh, avoid uh, hostile conflict over it, but I suspect we're going to continue to disagree to some extent uh, on that issue. Uh, and there are other issues on which we will continue to disagree. That's where I call for us to do the functional decoupling, to set aside those issues where we do disagree, to work together pragmatically on the economic topics. Uh, I think that's quite possible. Uh, I think the United States would agree to do that. I don't know if China would agree. Taiwan is obviously a core interest for China. But in my reading, and I say this in my book, an open world economic system is also a core interest of China. And steps that create backlash, that threaten the continuation of that open economic system uh, are also uh, very detrimental for China. So that's a cardinal test. We're about to get past the party congress in China. We're about to get past the midterm elections in the United States. Uh, that maybe gives us a window of a year or two where we may be able to start some new initiatives. And if the leadership in both countries recognize that we must step back from this continued drift toward confrontation, uh, doing it in the way I suggest, I think would be the most natural. Get rid of the trade war, fully reciprocal in the economic interests of both countries. Not either country by getting rid of that needless uh, co conflict. 
and it would give an enormous boost to both our bilateral relationship and to confidence in the world economy at a time when the world economy is shaky and needs such a boost. So I think something down that path, after we both get by our upcoming uh, uh, political watersheds, uh, might be the way to go. Yes, yes, uh, that, that's really a, a great message. I think that uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, having the uh, China has a 20th uh, uh, party Congress coming up, U.S. has midterm coming up, we have a G20 APEC summit coming up. It's all, it's all uh, you know, it's, we're getting the busy political season. Uh, uh, but, but you're right. I think, you know, after all, we need to really emphasize uh, global multilateralism, <laughs> global government governance to be strengthening China, U.S., and, and including EU. We should really work together and, and go both sides to, to, to really sustain this uh, improve, enhance uh, our, our global system. So that we can avoid those, uh, uh, you know, big distraction on the on the on the on the on, on the geopolitical front, and uh, this is really a, a, a great uh, a dialogue we had with you, uh, Fred. I mean, <laughs> we really enjoyed so much uh, talking to you. You have a lot of wisdom. You have a lot of experience. Uh, so, so we will, uh, you know, make this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we we actually we're going to thank all our audience. Uh, you know, thank all our people, uh, uh, participants, scholars, uh, and and fellows, and uh, and also of course the media that uh, that can uh, transmit this. So so we we actually appreciate uh, all the all the contribution you made. So uh, uh, in the end, I mean, we we are coming to the end, and uh, uh, your book is really a, a, a very stimulating book, and you emphasize China U.S. Uh, global uh, leadership. Uh, and, and together with others, but also uh, you really have uh, this big vision of uh, uh, you know getting getting China more actively into the international system, like IMF, uh, World Bank, you know global infrastructure, and and uh, uh, and uh, other other issues, the WTO. So so those are great uh, messages uh, that we really appreciate. Uh, so maybe last word, uh, Fred, uh, uh, before we leave, uh, you, you have anything to conclude? Uh, just, just, to, just to thank you very much for hosting me. Uh, I share your hope that the book might be translated in, into Chinese, published in China. Uh, I would very much welcome uh, wide readership in China and reactions from uh, your Chinese colleagues, as you have done uh, in this interview, to, uh, to tell me what they think of it and how it can be improved, how it can be implemented. Uh, how we could both move together. Uh, I'll just end with, with where I started, which was to say that I wrote the book because I really do think finding a way for the U.S. and China, the, the two, the only two economic superpowers, to work together effectively is absolutely essential if the global economic system is to continue to be successful, prosperous, stable, if it's to contribute to world peace and security, uh, I think that's the biggest challenge that uh, that our countries face in the years and, and probably decades ahead. And uh, I simply hope to, to make a modest contribution uh, to moving in that direction. And I appreciate your kind words and, and support for some of my ideas. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. And uh, absolutely, I think China and U.S. has to work together for the, for the sake of mankind and for the sake of the world. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, you taking time talking to us, and we hope that we'll uh, have your, you know, this book uh, be introduced to the Chinese readers. Thank you so much. We hope to see you, and I welcome you come to CCG next time when you're in China. And I hope to visit Peterson Institute again too. Thank you.